Hey everyone, ready to untangle some mysteries. Mysteries. The mysteries of language. We're diving deep into some fascinating essays and philosophy all about how we actually build meaning with words. Get ready, it's gonna get kinda deep. You know, it's funny, we use language every single day but we rarely stop to think about how complex it actually is. I know, right? The act of speaking, writing, even just thinking, it's all built on layers of rules and interpretations. Okay, I'm intrigued. So what are we gonna uncover in this deep dive? Give me the inside scoop. Well, the sources you shared all point to a central idea that's kind of mind blowing when you really think about it. Okay, you've got my attention, hit me with it. It's the idea that simply defining words, like labels on a box, misses the bigger picture of how we actually use language. I think I see where you're going with this. We're going to explore the idea of meaning as use and why it matters so much. Meaning as use. I've got to admit, that sounds both obvious and kind of revolutionary at the same time. Tell me more. What's the big deal with this whole meaning as use idea? Think of it this way. Have you ever tried to explain a color to someone who's been blind since birth? Mm, that's a good one. You can use all the adjectives in the world, but without the actual experience of seeing color, they won't truly grasp the concept. Right, they need that context. Language is similar. It's not just about static definitions, but how we use words in action, in specific situations. So it's like learning by doing, not just memorizing a dictionary. Exactly. I can see how that applies to concrete things, you know, like describing a tree or a house, but our source material goes beyond that, right? We're talking about the Tower of Babel and even Humpty Dumpty. Those are some pretty abstract ideas. What's the connection to language there? Those metaphors are really interesting starting points. They get at the heart of some fundamental questions about language. Okay, I'm ready for a metaphor breakdown. Remember the Tower of Babel? That ambition to create one perfect universal language. Yeah, the ultimate communication dream team. Right. Well, early philosophers were kind of like that, trying to build a tower of words up to heaven with pure logic. A noble goal, for sure. But didn't that story end badly? Exactly. As the story goes, it all came crashing down. And I'm guessing there's a lesson in there somewhere for us, right? There is. And to understand it, we can look at Humpty Dumpty, who wasn't exactly known for his resilience either. Mm -hmm. He really believed in words having very specific, fixed meanings. And we all know how that turned out. All the king's horses and all the king's men. Exactly. Humpty Dumpty is a cautionary tale. Insisting that words mean only what we want them to ignores the reality of how language actually works. Context is everything. So it's like trying to shove a square peg into a round hole, trying to make language fit into this rigid structure. Exactly. This rigid way of thinking just can't account for all the ways that context shapes meaning. Okay, so if the Tower of Babel and Humpty Dumpty represent what not to do, who's giving us a different perspective? I'm seeing the name Wittgenstein pop up a lot in these sources. Wittgenstein really revolutionized how we think about language. He urged us to shift our focus away from these fixed definitions. Okay, I'm listening. He argued that instead of looking for some absolute meaning, we should look at how language is actually used. Meaning in use again. I'm seeing a pattern here. Yes, it's all connected. And one of Wittgenstein's central ideas is this concept of language games. Language games. Okay, that sounds intriguing but also kind of confusing help me out here think of it this way every time we use language it's like we're participating in a different game each with its own set of rules and goals okay i think i'm starting to get it but give me an example or two well think about it the way we talk to our friends is different from how we write a formal email totally different and a scientific paper uses language very differently from a poem night and day right each of these is a kind of language game with its own unique rules so instead of trying to find one definition that fits every situation, we should think about a word's purpose in that specific language game. It's exactly, it's all about context. So we're not looking for one right answer about what a word means in a vacuum. We need to think about its purpose, the language game we're playing in that moment. It's about understanding the rules of the game. Exactly. Which makes me wonder about all those times I've misunderstood someone or felt misunderstood myself. Oh, tell me about it. It happens to all of us. Maybe we're just playing by different rules without even realizing it. It's very possible. Yeah. And that actually connects to another one of Wittgenstein's key ideas, meaning isn't found in some abstract definition, mm -hmm. but in the use of a word over time. Okay, so how does that work? He calls it the career of a word. 
the career of a word. I've never thought about it like that, but I like it. Tell me more about this career path for the words in my vocabulary. Just like a person's career can change and develop over time, so too can the meaning of a word. Think about a word like cool. Yeah. It meant something very different in the 1950s than it does today, right? That's true. Super different vibes. Exactly. A word's career is shaped by how it's used in different contexts by different people over time. So language is constantly evolving. Precisely. It's a living, breathing thing. And this idea of a word's career helps explain how we can make sense of more abstract concepts, too. There's no single concrete thing that perfectly embodies, say, justice or freedom. Right. Yeah, those are big, complex ideas. Right. But we still use these words meaningfully because of what Wittgenstein called family resemblances between different instances. Family resemblances. Okay, I'm intrigued. Break that down for me. Think of it like how we might all have our grandmother's nose, but in different ways. Some of us might have it more prominently, others less so. But there's still a connection, a shared characteristic. Okay, I see what you mean. So it's not about finding one perfect definition, but rather seeing the connections, the overlaps between different uses of a word. Exactly. Think about the word game. A board game, a sport, a child's game of pretend. They're all different activities, but we recognize a common thread a shared set of characteristics that link them together under this umbrella of game. That makes sense. So it's about recognizing those family ties in language. And you know what's really wild? This idea of family resemblances even applies to nonsense words, like those we find in Lewis Carroll's poems. Oh, I love those poems. Complete madness, jabberwocky anyone. Right. They're whimsical and fantastical, but they still work because they're playing with our expectations of language, with the rules we assume are always in play. It's like he's invented a whole new language, but we can still kind of understand it. It's bizarre. It is. And that actually brings us to another crucial point about Wittgenstein's philosophy. He was fascinated by the limits of language, by those things that are difficult or even impossible to put into words. I can relate to that. We've all had those moments where words fail us, right? Wow. Like trying to describe a dream or a really intense emotion. Exactly. Get that feeling like you're trying to grab onto smoke. It just slips through your fingers. The words just aren't enough. Exactly. Wittgenstein recognized that language isn't this perfect, all-encompassing tool that some people might assume it to be. There are things that lie beyond its reach. Things we can feel, but not fully articulate. Aspects of our experience that are difficult, or maybe even impossible, to truly express in words. So where does that leave us? If we can't always rely on language to perfectly accurately represent reality, then how do we make sense of the world and our place in it? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And Wittgenstein doesn't offer any easy answers. Typical philosopher, right? Right. But he encourages us to be more aware of the limitations of language, to acknowledge that there are things we may never be able to fully grasp or express through words alone. So it's about recognizing the mystery, embracing the unknown. In a way, yes. And it's about being okay with that. Our source material also mentions a debate surrounding something called contextualism. Contextualism. We're bringing in even more isms now. This is getting intense. Well, contextualism is particularly relevant to this idea of language's limits because it emphasizes that the meaning of what we say can't be completely determined by the words themselves. There's that meaning and use idea popping up again. It all connects. Contextualism argues that meaning relies heavily on the circumstances surrounding an utterance. The speaker, the listener, their shared history, the broader social context, all of it plays a role. So even if we had like the most perfect dictionary in the world with every possible definition of every word, communication could still break down. Oh, absolutely. Think about how much we rely on tone of voice, body language, shared cultural knowledge to interpret even the simplest statements, like a phrase like, that's interesting. Which could mean anything. Exactly. It could be genuine interest, polite disinterest, sarcastic disapproval. It all depends on how it's said, who's saying it, and in what situation. So context is king or queen. Exactly. And this debate about contextualism isn't just some abstract philosophical exercise either. Mm. It has real-world implications for how we interpret everything from legal contracts to casual conversations. So what I'm hearing is that maybe we should all be issued a crash course in contextualism 101 before sending our next text message. Huh. Right. It might save a few misunderstandings along the way. But on a more serious note, being aware of the role of context is absolutely essential for clear and effective communication. 
Okay, so we've got meaning is use, language games, the importance of context. Our source material also delves into the relationship between language and thought. Ah, yes. Getting into some deep philosophical waters here. Things are about to get really meta, aren't they? They are. Because one of the big questions we're grappling with here is, does language simply reflect what we think? Or does it actually shape the way we think? That's a big one. So are we prisoners of our own language, or is it more of a two-way street? That's the debate. Wittgenstein, I think, would probably say it's more of a dance than a dictatorship. I like that. A language dance party. Right. He argued that while our thoughts obviously come before our words, the language we use can then influence how we perceive the world. It can even shape the categories we think in. So it's like the words we use aren't just these neutral labels for things in the world. They carry a whole lot of baggage with them. That's a great way to put it. Our assumptions, our cultural biases, all of that gets baked into the way we communicate. It's like we're seeing the world through this linguistic filter. We're not just passively inheriting language, but actively shaping it through our interactions with each other. Think about how different cultures have different words for colors. Some have distinct terms for every shade imaginable, while others use a single word for both blue and green. And some linguists believe this can actually affect how those cultures perceive color. So the language we grew up with can literally shape what we see. It's a possibility. And it just goes to show how powerful language can be. That's incredible. And a little unnerving, too, if I'm being honest. Right. It's a powerful reminder that our way of speaking, our way of seeing the world, it's not the only way. There's no one right way to language. Exactly. There's so many different language games being played out there in the world. It's like we're all walking around with different sets of linguistic glasses. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. And it's why it's so important to be open to other perspectives, other ways of using language. To try on different glasses, so to speak. Exactly. The more we learn about different languages and cultures, the more we realize how diverse human thought and experience truly is. It's kind of humbling, isn't it? It really is. And it brings us back to one of Wittgenstein's core ideas that we keep coming back to. Which is? That language isn't just about representing the world around us. It's about doing things in the world. Okay, I like where you're going with this. So words are more than just labels. They have an active power. Exactly. Think about the impact our words have on other people, on our relationships. Even on society as a whole. Precisely. And that's something Wittgenstein felt very strongly about, especially in his later work. He urged us to move away from trying to define the true meaning of words in isolation. Because it's all relative. In a way, yes. What really matters is how we use language in our interactions with each other, how words function in specific situations to achieve different goals. So it's less about what language is and more about what it allows us to do. Exactly. He uses this example of a shopkeeper. Okay, I'm listening. Imagine you walk in and ask for, say, five red apples. Now, we could get all philosophical and debate the nature of redness or the concept of fiveness. I can see where that would lead to a very long shopping trip. Right. But within that specific interaction, what matters is that you and the shopkeeper understand each other well enough to complete the transaction. It's all about communication and shared understanding, not getting bogged down in abstract philosophical debates. Exactly. And that's one of the most powerful takeaways from this whole deep dive, I think. When we shift our focus from meaning to use, it opens up a whole new way of thinking about language and its power. So instead of getting stuck on definitions, we should be thinking about the purpose, the intended outcome of what we say and how we say it. Yes, because language is powerful. It really is. Knowing that our words have this power to shape our reality. That's a pretty amazing thought to end on, don't you think? It really is. It's a testament to the enduring power of Wittgenstein's ideas. Even decades after his death, they continue to challenge us, to provoke us, to inspire us to think more deeply about language and its role in our lives. Well said. And to all our listeners out there, we hope this deep dive has sparked your curiosity. Maybe it's even changed how you think about the words you use every single day. Remember, language isn't just something we learn, it's something we do. So go out there and use your words wisely, thoughtfully, and with intention. This has been The Deep Dive, and we'll see you next time. Until then.